our late brother Yao Te lived a life exemplifying the teachings of the Buddha, striking a balance between the pursuit of learning, handicraft, discipline, etc., with contentment. And tonight, we dedicate this sharing to, this, to his memory, such a wonderful man who passed away, and that's Brother Yao Wei. He has lived a life taking part in both Mahayana and Theravada activities. He has lived a life paying respect to Sangha of both lineages. Whether it is a house fellowship, and whether it is a center, it is always present to help in technical aspects, personally, as passed away, a wake service for him and we do not need to worry for he is a good man and we do not need to worry about good people his transit we are very confident will be smooth and he will go on walking in the Buddha's footprints so in the Mangala Sutta the Buddha clearly taught us that no one owes us a living and that every one of us here need to be possessed of wise learning. We need to be skilled in whatever we do. And of course, we need to be disciplined and of pleasant speech. So I hope this very, very clearly tells us that there is no circumstance in which we can misinterpret contentment as laziness. The Buddha certainly worked very hard for 45 years after his awakening. He certainly was another example to all of us. So we remember must be possessed of vast learning, education, professionalism, Skillful in handicraft, whatever profession you are in, be skillful. Do not be laid back, pick up a bad attitude, but be the best that you can be. Be disciplined in a pleasant speech. So this is important, and no one owes us a living. Please remember that. And the Buddha also in the Mangala Sutta taught us that reverence to those deserving our respect, despite whatever you achieve, humbleness, and importantly, contentment, gratitude, are equally important qualities and listening to the Dhamma at the proper time. So, balancing two things contentment with the need for you to be educated and to be skilled. What does this contentment mean? Gerald tries his very best. He achieves. Whatever he has achieved, he is content with that professional achievement, that education that he received. There will be many things along the way that he may not be able to achieve. But he is also content with that. Then you really understand what this sentence means. Despite knowing a lot, he still has the attitude of equanimity and contentment. Despite being highly professionally trained and motivated, he is content with what he achieved. And he is also content and satisfied 
with whatever he has not been able to achieve. I hope you understand this line, Wu zi yi wu de. When you truly understand the Buddha's teachings, then you understand why equanimity, contentment is so important. Now in the Dhammapada, verse 204, what is the greatest gain? Good health. Now, if you are to ask a healthy man, what are your needs? What are your wants? He may have a long, formidable list. But if you are to ask a sick man, what are your needs? What are your wants? You will find that a sick man has very little. His focus will be, can I be able to recover? And if not, can I go peacefully? Will my family be at peace? Will those dependent on me be taken care of? That's about all he wants. He's not interested whether he's driving a MyV, a Saga, or a BMW. He's not interested in all that because all that makes no sense anymore. Contentment, the Buddha said, is the greatest wealth. And this is what we are sharing tonight. A trustworthy relationship, faithfulness is the best in any relationship. And of course, Nibbana, the highest bliss. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, I have explained that we need to be possessed of vast learning. Do not walk away thinking that you can be lazy. No, the Buddha never in any time thought that. You have to be well trained, well educated, but be content with whatever you have gained. Be content with whatever you have not gained. A man who can be content is truly the richest man. And we are actually all sick. Every one of us is sick. How do we know that you are still alive a week or two from now? None of us do, especially in this era of COVID-19. None of us can even be sure whether we'll be alive two weeks from now. You are similar to a man in that position. Then you will realize that what your needs are are actually very little. I'm going to show you now a clip that explains this very well. Please pay attention to this clip. Hi guys, Prince EA here at Contentment with a special offer for you today. Ever wonder why you're never happy? Even when you get the things you want, the feeling just never lasts. Well, I've got exactly what you've been looking for. Contentment. Advertisers and marketers have spent billions of dollars tricking us into wanting more and more. They want you to buy, buy, buy to satisfy their evil, selfish greed. They say, this makeup will make you look pretty and you'll be happy. Or this car will make you a hit with your friends and you guessed it, you'll be happy. But it's like you're chasing this butterfly that's constantly out of reach. Because you see, the truth is you can never have enough of what you don't really want. I'm here today to offer you a little contentment because contentment is what you've been looking for all along. Here's why. Take the new iPhone. Timmy here waited in line for three days trying to get his hands on this phone. He hated his old phone and when he got the new one, he was so happy. Now the million dollar question is, did the phone make him happy or was it the release from the craving of the phone that made him happy? The phone? Duh. No, Timmy, there's nothing in this phone that made you happy. It was the release from the craving of the phone. See, when you craved this phone, you had a lot of tension and anxiety and stress building up. And when you got the phone, you were released from those stresses. You wrongly attributed the peace and joy that you got from the release to the phone. Wow, I never looked at it like that. Many people haven't, Timmy. So they continue running to the next stupid thing, thinking that it will bring them happiness. But what they were really looking for is contentment. Before contentment. We longed for that nice house. With the picket fence. It was so stressful, we thought about it all the time. All the time, but now, after contentment. We learned to love our little apartment. We've never been happier before. Before contentment, I was miserable. I had to get the latest fashion, the latest everything. 
but once I noticed that I had enough already, I have never been happier. Thanks, contentment. And you lovely people at home can have your contentment too. For zero easy payments of just zero dollars, just look inside yourself and realize that these material things have never made you happy for very long. But wait, there's more. Call in the next 10 minutes and we'll throw in some gratitude for free. Contentment. It's what you've always been looking for. Brothers and sisters, I hope you realize that this is the second noble truth. The second noble truth teaches us that there is a cause for our dukkha. And the cause for our dukkha is our endless craving and desires. And as is well illustrated in this video clip, why was Timmy so happy? He thought it was the new form, but actually it's not. It is the release of his craving for a new form that made him happy. So if you can understand that, now you understand that if you do not have that craving, that need for it to be released, to be relieved. You are already happy. So this is a concept that not many people are aware of. The need to release that craving, that craving is making us have dukkha, dissatisfaction, emotional turmoil. And here I show you a Chan teaching which teaches this even further. Ping Yu Fu. Wajing Wakane. You in Nong Fu, Tai Shan Ye Jong, Wada Yizo, Jaji Lian Chang, the Jing Yu Han. <笑>我们这一生啊可都吃喝不尽了 你已成千万富翁了，还有什么是好忧愁的呢？忧愁啊，忧愁啊，因为我不知道另外的十七座罗汉在哪里。啊！For the non-Chinese speaking audience, let me explain. A dirt poor farmer. As he was digging his field, found a solid gold image of an Arahan. And when he brought it back home, his family members said, Wow, we will be able to feed ourselves our whole lives just with this one solid gold image of an Arahan. And so they were temporarily very happy. And then the farmer was very, very sad. Every day he was moaning and groaning. And his friends came and said, you have enough money, more than enough for your whole family. Why are you so sad? Why are you moaning and groaning? And he kept insisting, oh, sadness, sadness, great sadness. And when they asked him why, he said, I do not know where the other 17 golden images are. In classic Chinese thinking, these images come in sets of 18. So while he has found one, somewhere is the other 17. And he was unable to put his mind at risk because he was thinking, where are the other 17 images? This and the previous video on contentment, this tool teaches us a very important lesson. 
The farmer here was rich beyond means, beyond thinking, beyond his wildest dreams. And yet he was unhappy because his craving for the other 17 images has to be relieved. He was not content. And that is what we are taught in the second noble truth. Tanha. That as long as we are craving, we will not be happy. We will create the seeds for dukkha, dissatisfaction, emotional turmoil, etc. So this is a very common word that we hear. Oh, I'm in the pursuit of happiness or in my pursuit of happiness. They should put this, yes, this warning, high voltage current, high danger. Because whenever you are in the pursuit of happiness, you know, you are like the racing dogs. You know those racing dogs? They chase a mechanical rabbit that is spun round the track. That rabbit is always out of reach of even the fastest dog. They are always just chasing that mechanical rabbit and never ever getting it. So when you are in the pursuit of happiness, that is what is happening to all of us. We are all chasing after that mechanical rabbit, thinking that when we get it, we will be very happy, but we will never be able to get all the mechanical rabbits. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, please remember, we are all born without bringing anything. We all came naked with nothing. And similarly, we will all die without taking anything. Every time I conduct a funeral service, I teach myself this very profound lesson that one day it will be me lying at the back there and someone standing in front giving the same hope. I will go as you will go without taking anything, absolutely nothing, not even the clothes that are worn because when we get cremated, nothing is left but the ashes which will return to the elements. But in the tragedy of life, the sad thing is that in this interval between our birthday and our final day of death, we fight, we quarrel, what we cannot bring and what we will not take with us. We fight, we quarrel, we own our ego, we own our pride, all of which will disappear, all of which will be forgotten. We fight over money, over property, so many things. And when you look at it, it really makes no difference. And I always ask myself, and I ask people who ask me to also ask themselves that if you are dead in six months or if you know you're going to die in six months, will this, whatever is troubling you, matter anymore? If it doesn't matter, let it go. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, all of us want happiness. Everyone. The Buddha Dharma leads us to happiness. As we walk this path, every day we should be more happy because you know how to deal with unhappiness. You know how to let go of things which will make you unhappy. Let us listen to what His Holy Lust, the Dalai Lama, teaches here. The thing is, we want happiness. We do not want suffering. Everybody, everybody, any sentient being, now we are actually creating more unnecessary sufferings. I think very important to make clear to public. This is we are not talking about religion. If we have more compassion, God will please. We are not talking that. As a Buddhist, if we practice compassion, Buddha will support us. I am not talking that. If we are a more compassionate person, I get more benefit. I will be more happier person. That's, that's the point. Uh, here, I think one check, one, is in, one million of dollars. But here, 
no peace. That one million dollar will not bring inner peace, happiness. More frustration, wa? This money bring more frustration, more suspicion, more anxiety, or sometimes more jealous then. So inner peace is the ultimate source of happiness, joyfulness. So I think people do not understand that. Brothers and sisters, I think this happiness is what all of us want. But if we are chasing happiness like a dog chasing after the mechanical rabbit, we will never get it. Of course, our needs must be fulfilled, as I stated right at the beginning. And we have to strike a balance between our needs, our wants, and our happiness. If we are always placing our happiness in the hands of something that I must get before I am happy, then we will never be happy. If my ego creates unhappiness, disrupts my peace, too happy to let go of that ego. If my position gives me unhappiness, disruption of my inner tranquility, I'm more than happy to give up that position because the price of inner peace, inner happiness is priceless. So train yourself hard professionally, work hard, have the right attitudes, the right speech, have the right approach to doing business without breaking precepts, maintaining discipline, earn righteous wealth, and then breathe, take a moment and balance your life and enjoy your wealth. Enjoy your inner peace. And do not be like a dog chasing after a mechanical rabbit or be like a rat in a rat race. Even if you win, the rat in the rat race is still a rat and you are not a rat. So, True happiness is enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. Your happiness must not be in the hands of another person. Your happiness cannot be in the hands of a future toy, a car, a house, an apartment, whatever you think that on getting it, you will be happy because you will not. Your happiness will be at this moment with what you have. And even if you are still pursuing studies, still training, you can be happy in the moment. For us as Buddhists, we strike a middle path. Strike a middle path. Remember the Buddha taught us, neither the extreme of asceticism nor the extreme of luxury but a middle path. Examples, even in the food that we eat, you do not have to go to either extreme, but striking a middle path, trying to create as minimal suffering to others. For many years, it was always taught that fishes cannot feel pain. That is not true. I have a cousin brother who is a vet who has migrated to America, happily living there. And I confirmed with him again just maybe two weeks ago with regards to fishes. And he did confirm with me, sending me a few scientific papers that fishes do feel pain. So to even have a misconception that it is okay to go fishing for sport because fishes do not feel pain is actually wrong. And what I'm going to show you is a clip that is even more extreme. I am intentionally showing this so that we will walk the middle path while we need food to survive, while we need many things to survive. Let us do it without causing pain to too many things. Let us strike the middle path between the extreme of asceticism and the extreme of luxury. Take a look at this. 
Like your food fresh? Ikizukuri is the preparation of sashimi made from live seafood. The most popular sea animal used in ikizukuri is fish, but octopus, shrimp, and lobster may also be used. The most controversial part of this Japanese practice is the fact that the animal continues to move after death. The chef will take the fish or shellfish to be served out fish tank after rinsing it and then fillet and sliced up in such a manner so as to prepare sashimi from it, but without killing the animal itself. Immediately, the animal is still alive, I'd imagine, though briefly, and is then served on a plate as decoration to the sashimi made from its own flesh. Yes, imagine this. The fish wasn't just raw, it was still alive. While the flesh was neatly cut in slices of sashimi, the head was still moving. These dishes shown in Chiba, Japan, are ikizukuri, or live fish, whereas sashimi is the eating of raw fish. With the- so, brothers and sisters, let us walk this path in the middle way. Neither the extreme of torturing yourself depriving yourself, nor the other extreme of luxury. We need to eat, we need to dress, we need to do many things to be alive because this body is the vehicle that we need for the path in which we walk. But let us do it without causing too much pain to the others. And this is an example of greed to the extreme, contentment, with whatever you are eating, avoiding the extremes, I think is what we need to do. Now I'm going to show you another clip as to why we tend to be a little bit obsessive about things. And it's actually part of our evolutionary mindset. This missing cow syndrome is a bit long, but I ask you to please bear with me and listen and look because it teaches us an important lesson. I would like you to imagine sitting in a room, looking up at a tiled ceiling, and you notice that one tile is missing, just one. What would you concentrate your vision on? What would you look at the most? The answer, of course, is the missing tile. Hmm. Now, that's fine for ceilings. In fact, it's actually good because we can replace a ceiling's missing tile and once again have a perfect ceiling. Ceilings, after all, can be perfect. But this doesn't apply to life. Most of what is missing in our lives, or what we think is missing, cannot be replaced. Unlike a ceiling, life can never be made perfect. For that reason, concentrating on the missing tiles in your life is a big problem. Let me give you the example that taught me this great lesson about what I call the missing tile syndrome. A bald man once said to me, you know, Dennis, whenever I walk into a room with people, all I see is hair. When I heard this, I immediately realized that in this regard, this man sees the world completely differently from how I do. Because I have all my hair. When I walk into a room, I don't even notice hair. It's not a missing tile for me. But for this person, hair is what he sees. This applies in some way to everyone. When a woman who thinks she has imperfect legs walks into a room, all she sees are perfect legs. Or take the example of the woman who once said to me, wherever I go, all I see are pregnant women. Now, how could that be? The vast majority of women, even those young enough to be pregnant, are not pregnant at any given time, but that was all she saw because she wanted to get pregnant and wasn't able to. Her missing tile was not having a child. That's the way human nature is. We focus on what's missing in our lives. The missing tile syndrome is a very big obstacle to happiness, so big in fact that it makes happiness almost impossible. There will always be something missing in your life. When you see other people's kids, you'll think you see tiles that are missing in your own children. Gee, why can't my kids study as hard, or be as polite, or be as bright, or be as good looking, or be as athletic? The same holds true regarding our spouses, our work, our looks. The list is endless. I'll give one more example. When I was single and looking to find the right woman, 
I wanted to first identify the most important trait to look for in my future wife. So after almost every date, I would call my best friend Joseph and announce, Joseph, tonight I identified the most important trait in a woman. And he would always say, okay, Dennis, what is it? And then patiently listen. One night I would tell him that it was intelligence, another night that it was looks, another night personality, and on yet another night, kindness. One night, as usual, I called him up after an evening out and said, Joseph, I finally figured out what the most important trait in a woman is. But this time he didn't say, okay, Dennis, what is it? Instead he said, don't tell me, I'll tell you. Perplexed, I asked, how do you know? You don't even know the woman I went out with. It doesn't matter, he said. Whatever trait tonight's woman was missing, that's the one you decided is the most important trait in a woman. I could say nothing, he was right. Whatever that night's date was missing is what I would declare the most important trait in a woman. I hadn't yet come up with the term missing tile syndrome, but that is exactly what I was suffering from. That's the way we play tricks on ourselves and undermine our happiness, by concentrating on the missing tiles every one of us has. So we really have a simple choice. Do we focus on the rest of the ceiling, on all the tiles we do have, or do we focus on the ones we're missing? To a large extent, the answer to that question will determine how happy you will be. I'm Dennis Prager. And my brothers and sisters, I hope you realize that this is the first noble truth. Our lives will never, ever be perfect. Even if I have to make you the king of a country, it will still not be perfect because there will always be something that you want. In the first noble truth, the common denominator is dukkha. Dukkha is not just suffering, it's emotional stress, it's a inability to satisfy that endless craving is the instability, the unreliability of life. It is the nature of life to be impermanent and changing, and hence it becomes unreliable. The first noble truth clearly tells us that. The second noble truth is with regards to kanha, craving. So if you're gonna be happy, you have to realize the second noble truth and then learn not to have so many cravings, to let go. And then to learn to live with the anicca, dukkha, anatta, or the imperfection of life, to learn to flow like water around rocks. Then you will reach a state, the third noble truth, whereby you will have less and less and less dukkha because you are planting less and less seeds. You have less and less craving. You are now content with the missing cow. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, the Buddha has clearly said the Dhamma is not something exoteric or hidden. If you just look around, it is always there. And these videos teaches us in modern 21st century terms, in modern concepts that we can understand the very same basic foundation of truth that the Buddha taught. And of course, one of the major things that leads to our inability to be content is this huge ego. I. I am the only one who this. I am the one who is that. I'm the only one who does this. I'm the only one. The word I, so big. You know, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, if you look at the English language, how do you spell you, we, and you, my friend, that you is written in small, not cap. And we go to the zoo. We is also written in small. But whenever you write the word I, how do you write it? It's always in capital letters. 
Even our language reflects that. So don't be surprised if you ever email me or send me a text and I try my best to write I in small letters, except my phone's autocorrect insists that I write it in capital letters. Even our language reflects that. Our ego, power, position, name, all this comes in and they create situations where we create more dukkha for ourselves and for others. I want to show you a little clip that illustrates this. ありがとう。ありがとう。神様。神様。<笑> So brothers and sisters, while we might find this little clip funny and have a good laugh, it is true. It is very true that our thoughts all circle around I. And I think if you can understand this, you are actually truly understand why metta, karuna can only be practiced genuinely, fully when you are an awakened being. Because as long as you are not an awakened being, our actions still will circle around I. It's the truth. Let's be very, very honest. For an awakened being, when they look at us, for an awakened being, when they look back at their previous deeds, they will see that everything has a little selfish motive. What is in there for me? And of course, that creates discontentment. We want something else. Another very funny clip to remind you that contentment is your greatest wealth. So again, Dhamma family, while you may again find that almost hilarious, it teaches us an important lesson. Be careful what you wish for, because your wish may just come true. Let us learn to be content. And I want to show you one more clip. It's in a language that you don't understand, that I don't understand, but the translation is very important for us. It sums up what I said at the very beginning. Uh, 
それ Okay, I think that explains it really very, very clearly because there are people who think that contentment means be like a doormat and that is far from the truth. It is not. And renunciation is not saying, oh dear, I have too many difficulties in life and so I'm running away. You know, in Chinese, they often say, Oh, That means, oh, he has got so many things he cannot solve, blah, 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 blah. And so because of that, he became a monk or a nun. No, 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 no. In fact, it's the opposite. It is because he saw the truths of life that he went on to renounce to be a Sangha. And not the opposite, that you know, the, the Chinese always think that when a person chujia, that means oh, your great family difficulties, he couldn't accept it. So now he renounced and become a monk or a nun. But that is a completely wrong concept because it is not that. In fact, it is the opposite. That people renounce because they have seen the truth of life and they do not see the need to be in a red race, but is, instead they want to find the answers, to seek awakening, and to learn to completely let go. All right. So whether one is poor, or whether one is rich, or in between, we can all be content. When we give, it does not mean just giving money. You can give skill, you can give time, you can volunteer, or you can give a smile. You can give meta. You can radiate meta. And people can sense meta. People can sense hostility. I am sure if someone is very hostile to you, the instant you walk into a room, Dhamma family members here, you can sense it. Similarly, there have been, there have been venerables that I've met 
who literally under inverted commas specialize in meta. And the instant we walk into their company, into their presence, you literally can sense the meta that these highly trained Sangha members are able to radiate upwards. So even if you are materially poor, you can still offer a lot of things, skill, a seat in the bus, a smile, meta, compassion, and it need not be just money. So Dhamma family members, I have shared with you tonight with regards to contentment and why we need to strike a balance and the man who is content or the woman who is content will lead a much happier life than a person who is like the dog chasing after the mechanical rabbit. We need to fulfill our needs. We need to fulfill some of our wants, but we should not be a rat in a rat race ending up as a rat even if we win. With that, I would like to end tonight's sharing. As I said early at the beginning, I dedicate tonight's sharing to the memory of Brother Yao Tik, who was a selfless person who offered his skills in technology, in IT, who helped us in the early days when we were quite ignorant of even how to use a mixer, how to use even simple things like connecting our computer to the projectors. And whenever we have any problem with our computers or run into problem with software, it is always Brother Yao Tik that we turn to. And he will drop everything to come forward to help us. He has left us in a rather short time, but he has led such a wonderful life. He has taken good care of his family and dependents. And even right to the very end, he made sure all of them are well taken care of. Some of us have the great blessing and privilege to care for him right till his last few hours. And it has been an honor for those of us who cared for him. To see how a man can face death with contentment, dignity, and letting go. And one of the most beautiful things that I've seen was when his my wife, his dear wife called me at about midnight or past when he began to be very difficult in his physical state. And then we, when I went over, the wife was holding his hand and she was chanting for him the various suttas that he's familiar with. Then we took whatever we could medically. We did whatever we could medically to make him comfortable. And we all held hands and chanted our favorite chants we chanted for him as he slowly faded away. I think that if any one of us is to die, that is one of the best ways to die. With refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, with the taking of the precepts, with the recalling of the virtues of the Buddha, and knowing that we have led a good life, knowing that we have done what we need to do as our responsibilities and then content with whatever we had done and finally letting it all go. Letting it all go. With that, I would like to end. Again, thank you to Gerald, my moderator, and to the IT team, without whom none of any of these one whole year or more of talks will be able to progress such a smooth manner. Thank you. Sadu, sadu, sadu.